one song that he knows my name. I've been around people and I've been around them and and somehow they forget my name. But to think that God knows my name. <laughs> he says, my sheep know me and they follow me and they know my voice. And that song does something. I don't know who's in this room today, but that song ministered to you just like it ministered the rest of us. And it doesn't matter what you're going through, what you've gone through. Girl, he know your name. And not only does he know your name, he know where you are. He know not just physically, he know where you are emotionally. He know where you are spiritually. He know where you are. That's what makes me so happy. I was, this morning, I just really got to up this morning because to think about all the things that we deal with in life. And sometimes you think God don't care. Sometimes you think he has forgotten your name, but he hadn't forgotten your name. He knows your name. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this privilege, God, to be here again today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the experience we've had here this morning, Lord, and, and hearing the songs of praise, God, that have been ushered up to you. And God, it's amazing that you know our name. In fact, you said you know every hair on our head. Everyone has been numbered. There's not even a sparrow that falls on the ground that, God, you don't know. In fact, you told us, God, why take you thought for your life? If I took care of the sparrow, and if I clothe the grass of the field, even so, God, you take care of us as well. And if you care for the sparrow, then, Lord, certainly you care about us too. But, God, sometimes it's hard sometimes. Sometimes, God, when we're going through things and and we're dealing with things in our life. Sometimes, God, we think that you forgot about us. And, but Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that you would minister to us, God, not only through song, but God, through your word, reminding us, God, that you love us. And if we feel distant from you, it's not that you moved. Lord, we did. But God, in Jesus' name, we ask that, God, you receive us back unto yourself. We give you praise and glory, for we ask this in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Pastor Wolfred and I hear it in Psalms uh, 95, but and I'm going to go back there, but I want to read from John chapter 2. And the Jews' Passover, I'm reading at verse 13, Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made an end in it, made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said unto him that sold doves, Take these things thence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Now back in Psalms 95, in reading that verse, he says, Oh, come and let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise unto the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. A few days ago, I was talking to a pastor who expressed to me his concerns about the apathy that he has seen or witnessing in the church. 
He said he noticed that people don't have the enthusiasm they used to have years ago. Hallelujah, somebody. In his dismay, he indirectly blamed himself for not doing more to incite the spiritual appetite in the congregation in which he was serving. So the pastor thought it a good idea was to change the worship style. So he implemented what they call a contemporary service, wherein they eliminated the choir and they put together what they call a band. Amen, somebody. They even start to brewing coffee and selling donuts or serving donuts in between services and even doing services in order that they may appeal to the social side of the membership. As I kept talking to this young man, he was, he was becoming discouraged. Can I tell y'all some pastoring is hard? Can I tell y'all that y'all ain't always this cute? And sometimes you can be downright discouraging to serve at times. This man of God shared with me that not only was he witnessing the apathy in his congregation, but he also felt the effects of himself because he said his prayer life was starting to diminish. He wasn't studying like he used to study. He wasn't preaching with enthusiasm that he once preached because of the apathy. This man, as I was saying in the crowd this morning, this man was standing on the cliff, amen, of almost committing spiritual suicide, almost ready to abandon ministry at all. He thought, thinking about dusting off his secular degree and hope that he could get a job in the secular world just to make ends meet, just in case he made the plunge to leave ministry. Priest Jones, amen, somebody. And before anyone start pointing fingers at this discouraged pastor, I want you to look at yourself because anybody can get discouraged. Priest Jones, amen. Hallelujah, somebody. Not, not just pastors get discouraged, but anybody in life can get discouraged, especially when you feel that your life, amen, is losing its meaning. Amen. Well, here in this text in Psalms 95, the psalmist was calling Israel back to worship. Apparently, Israel was having apathy in church. And, and one of the things that, that gets me, I look around uh, churches, and I'm going to give you a few stats in a few moments of what uh, there's a group that did a, a, a in-depth research on what was happening in America today. But in the text I just read about Jesus, Jesus at this time, there were apathy all in Israel in the time of our Lord. And they were doing all kinds of things in the temple. In fact, God was so revered in Israel that they would even call his name. But not only was it not called, and there were certain things they just would not even allow in the temple, let alone doing the things that they were doing in the temple. Jesus comes on the scene, 30-year-old 30, 30 young man, this itinerant preacher. They didn't know that he was God in flesh. He come walking among these people in the apathy that was in Israel today was so overwhelming that when Jesus walks in, he walks in the temple. He had just left Canaan of Galilee performing his first miracle of, amen, of making or turning water into wine. After he leave that, he make his first trip into the temple. He goes in the temple in his, in his ministry as now walking as the Messiah. He had been coming there as a little boy. At the last time we seen him, he was 12 years old when he made his way to the temple. He was asking and being asked questions by the scholars of that day. But now as he walks into the temple, just as it was prophesied that he would walk into the temple, he walks into the temple and blow and behold, when he gets to the temple, apathy was so thick in Israel that they were selling doves. They were selling oxen inside the temple. It was so discouraging to Jesus that he began to get a cord and he, he tied a cord together and began to beat the money changers and run these money changers and these guys that sold these, these and, and guess what? The high priest was also making money in the church. It was him that knowing that people were traveling from miles away to come to Jerusalem to worship, he knew they could not carry their lambs to offer sacrifices in Israel. So what he was doing at that time, when they came to the place, they had cattle, they had sheep and goats and whatever they were sacrificing there at the time, providing for the people who was making that pilgrimage to, to Jerusalem. 
And when they got there, they had exhorted prices. Come on, somebody. Prices to offer because knowing that when they come, they want to also offer sacrifices unto God. But when they got there, y'all ever went somewhere? You, anybody ever been to a football game and a hot dog you can get at 7-Eleven for $1.49? You got to pay $5 over in the arena. Come on, y'all. Go, talk to me just a little bit. And, 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 there, and you can buy, you can buy a, a, a soda pop, amen, for a dollar, a bottle of water for, for a dollar in a 7-Eleven. But you go to Dallas Cowboys Stadium, you got to pay $5 for an eight-inch bottle of water. Well, now I want you to get a picture of what was happening in Jerusalem. These people traveling for miles around to come. They was making pilgrims from a long way off to get there. And when they got there, the, in order to, to offer these things unto God, they had to pay these exorbitant prices, amen, in Israel. And guess who was over the high priest, Caiaphas and Ananias and all these men, they, were, they, were, they had a, 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 a little thing going on underneath the shadows of everything. And Jesus walks in the temple knowing now, I want you to know that he wasn't just some other man. This was God in flesh walking in and wondering why the people was not serving and worshiping God like they ought to. And sometimes we can do things. Sometimes leadership can get in the way of people worshiping God. And sometimes our traditions and things that, that we allow in the house of God that dampens, amen, somebody, and cloud worship with people coming before God. They have these, these, these sheep, smelly sheep in the house of God. The house of God used to be a place that was reverence, but now they've got stinking sheep in the house of God. They were changing money. And I don't know if you went out of town. We, when, when Darren and I, we went to uh, South Africa. One time we went to uh, Zimbabwe. We went to Israel. And when you come to change your money, they was making, I mean, I mean, sometimes they would change the money. In other words, your money could not be spent in that nation until you get their money. Come on, y'all. And they, they, and, they, and they tack on exorbitant prices for you to get the currency from that country because your currency is no good in that land. So you had to change your currency over to their currency. Darren, I, I mean, we had what Darren, sometimes we had like a, a few, few dollars in, in American dollars. We went to South Africa. He was saying, it's a, it's a thousand, whatever they call their money. I said, man, I got a thousand, some thousand African money. But the money was no worth, worth no more than $10 in America. But over there, they say, I had a thousand pesos, whatever they call them. I, had all, I said, man, I got a bunch of money in my pocket. Oh, a bunch. But you know what? To, to, but so you all can get a picture of what I'm saying. They had, they had just inflated the prices of these things. And Jesus walks in and seeing that he was God, he says, he said, take this stuff out of my father, Jones translation. Out of my, this should be the house of prayer. But this is what they're doing. Now, when I look around the church today, when I see people now, because now church, church now, you can get any kind of church you want right now. If you want you a church that got all, I mean, I say it that way. We got a Burger King, amen, mentality in church today. Come on. You know in Burger King, they say you can have it your way. Come on. And we got churches that whatever that you like, if you don't like your preacher tall, skinny, fat, you can go find your preacher you like. If you like a preacher or anything that you want, if you like a church, you have the service, all, you can find those type of churches. That's why we got so many churches that are popping up. And I'm telling you right now, I don't think we need more churches. We need more worshipers. We need more people that love God. Here, then back in this psalm, I want to talk this morning about rekindling the zeal for God. Amen, somebody. Now, in fact, in, if you say, well, pastor, this pastor you talked about was a scourge, but, but I wanted to, right in this room, right now, while I'm speaking, there is somebody in this room right now is discouraged, and you came to church this morning hoping that you hear a word that would inflame, amen, your faith again. Because there are people coming to church. I remember a, a, a few years ago, we couldn't get a seat in Antioch. We could, I mean, you have to get here early just to get a seat. But now you can sit anywhere you want to sit. Can I give you a few stats right here? And, and I, I didn't make this up. I, I just did my little research. A religious or research group called Revival Outside the Walls. He says, while one in four Americans are done with church, half of all Americans, 40%, are done with God. Known as post-Christians, they say that God plays no role whatsoever in their life any longer. 
37% of Americans trust in faith leaders and pastors has failed to a record low, ranking them below other professions such as teachers, police, and just above journalists. One in four pastors, 25% of pastors say that meeting a person's physical need takes priority over telling them about Jesus. They love to tell you about you're going to prosper. You're going to get a new car. You're going to get a new house. But we don't tell people about the spiritual problem they're having. We got more people to fill this church up and we can promise them that you're going to be rich by tomorrow. If you follow these five steps to your, to, come on somebody, to your destiny, and you're going to get new cars, diamond rings, long dresses, short dresses, all kinds of stuff, you can fill the church up because people want to talk about what they can get on this side. But, but what if you don't live to be long? What if, what if, you know, the Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? And not 25% of pastors care more about talking about prosperity than talking about Jesus. In other words, we're trying to get people to learn how to live on this side and not preparing them to live on that side. But we need to start telling people that on this side, because listen, these bodies of ours, they're weak. Today you got a friend and tomorrow you don't. Today that you're up and tomorrow you can be down. But now we need to start telling people about why they need the Lord, why worshiping him is important. You know what? I can imagine what God must feel like. He, look, look at us as a people. Look to us as a people. God has brought us a mighty long way. If some of us don't know where we come from, we ought to study our history books to find out that our foreparents had nothing like we have. And yet and still, they got to beg us to come to church. They would come to church and there was no air conditions. There was no padded pews. There was none of these things. And yet, they made the church every Sunday. They'll work in the corn fields and the cabbage fields and the apple fields and they'll work all day long and still get up and go to church. But us now, got making big money, working in jobs that making $150,000 a year and still can't come to church. Then not only that, but we got pastors and leaders of our church are also in a state of apathy. Oh, Lord. Deacons and pastors together. I had a pastor tell me, he says, Pastor Jones, he said, listen, man, I just go to church now. He said, because it was happening in our church, he said, I go to church and just get my check. He said, I don't put time in Bible study longer. I stay there just long enough to go home. He said, because that, you know, because, because they, I, don't, I don't make the money. I want them to pay me. So therefore, he dialed back on his ministry. Let me tell you something. God attests you. Sometimes God will see whether or not you'll serve me for $5 or you'll serve me more. for. Come on, somebody. Sometimes God will dial back a blessing just to see whether or not you'll stay with him. And sometimes he'll stretch your faith to see whether or not you're for real or not. And sometimes you know whether you're real or not that when you ain't got nothing, you still can praise God. In fact, in fact, the devil told God, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, you've been bragging about Job. He said, every time I came by Job's house, he said, he said have you considered my, my servant Job? He said, yeah, I've considered him. He said, every time I go by Job's house, there's a fence around it. Come on, somebody. Come on, y'all. Come on. He said, when I, see, I want you to know that the devil knows your name too. No, you ain't going. I'm already there now. He also knows your In fact, he has, he's already scoped you out. He's already know exactly what you like. See, the devil is not omniscient. He don't know everything. He has to get data. He has to watch what you like. He has to notice what gets you going and what makes you stop. He know your name too. In fact, you own his, even God has a list. The devil also has a list. And, and sometimes God goes, well, you consider, he said, yeah, I consider him Job. He said, I went by his house. And when I got there to mess with him, there was a fence around the house. I couldn't get to him. He said, I tell you what, you just dropped that fence. He said, see, Job was blessed man every day. And Job was so blessed. Come on, somebody. His children, even somebody, his whole household was dealing with apathy. His children was having parties every weekend. So every day, Job would get up at time to cycle of God. And Job was making his way to the altar, making sure that his children did not curse God. It's bad for a parent to worry about their grown kids. Let me go up here so y'all get mad. But Job would get up and go offer sacrifice before God and hoping that his children did not curse God. Then one day, 
The thing that Job feared the most, while his kids was partying in the house, the Bible says a strong wind came and killed all the kids was having a party in one of them out and killed all of them. Did I tell you something about God? God is jealous. Oh, preach, Jones. Amen, somebody. And the devil said, well, Lord, I tell you what, I took all this stuff from Job. I tell you what, let me touch him. I'll make him curse you to your face. See, Job, the only reason Job served you because, God, you done blessed him. The reason why Job served you because, see, Job is walking in prosperity. The reason why Job is serving you, Lord, because everybody know his name. Job is a big man. I tell you what, if, if you let me take all that, I'll make Job curse you. I'll make Job give up church. What has it taken for the devil to mess with you to make you dial back your worship of God? Come on, somebody. What has God, what, what do you figure God has allowed you to lose that causes you now to dial back your worship? You're, you're so unstable. You don't know where you're going to be at. The, the, you, I, I like the second Sunday because it's called the young adult choir going to sing. I like the first Sunday because this, I get communion. I like the third, I like the third Sunday because kids, you know, what Sunday is more important than the other? I want to talk about rekindling our zeal for God. We got to rekindle our zeal for the Lord because right now, if you don't believe what I'm saying, looking at this nation, this nation is in a wreck. And listen, if God don't judge America, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Amen. Come on, y'all. If, if God just does not judge America, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah. You can't even look at the TV with every commercial has intertwined in it something about homosexuality. Billy D. William just said yesterday, he said that he was trying to, to touch his, he was trying to in, get in contact with his feminine side and his male side. The homosexual, the, the, the Gasman group figured that he was saying he was homo, he had to come back and straighten that thing. He said, just because I talked about my, he said, I'm just talking about my soft side and talking about, he said, I ain't no gay. But the gays are looking for somebody. And right now they're trying to make that type of stuff normal and the church ain't saying nothing. Pastors are afraid to preach it because we're afraid we're going to lose our popularity. We're afraid we're going to lose members. But what if the Lord is going to come next week? There is nothing else that needs to be fulfilled before the rapture happens. What is it right now? What, 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 what needs to happen right now? Let me tell you, the Bible says that one day that trumpet is going to sound. The dead in Christ going to rise first. We that are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord. In. But how do we get to heaven? We're not getting to heaven because you're some Baptist. You never get there because you go to church two times a Sunday. You will get there based on what you know about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's only. But so often we're so busy. And now we got pastors that are so ambitious trying to build big ministries and trying to do the... Listen, it's not about that at all. In fact, don't you ever get in your mind that we are all into building big buildings. Everything we did in Anna, we did it because we were forced to do it. Come on, y'all. Our knees moved our, our ministry, not because we want to do it. No, our knees. See, we move by knees, not by something everybody wants. Priest Jones, amen, somebody. You listen to me, man. Listen to me, lady. There is something God has for you. He want to see whether or not, and you're not here listening to my voice by looking about you. God wants to see whether or not you are going to be stable with him or do you have another God in the Psalms. Can we look at Psalms for a minute? Look at Psalms 85. Psalms 85. Number one, he's calling them to come and worship God with unbridled praise by any means possible. He said in verse 1, oh, come and let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise. See, you should not be offended when you come to a church that praise God. I don't want to go to no church where they don't praise God. I don't want to go to church where, where I'm offending people when I shout hallelujah, praise the Lord. I don't want to go to a church. Let me tell you something. God's been too good for me to shut up on him right now. Let me go on this side. Amen, somebody. Can I tell you something right now? God has been so good to me. And if y'all if y'all if y'all don't keep if y'all keep pushing me right now, I'll shout right here, right now, because God has been good to me. I know God had, see, some of you has had it good all your life, but I have it good all my life. There are things I had, I had to go through lying, people lying on me, cheating on me, saying things about me. And praise God, God kept me through it all. So when I start praising God, don't you be offended. Listen, we ought to praise God, and when we come to church, it ought to be a place where we can worship God, and we shouldn't have nobody sitting up there thinking, oh, I don't even know. 
Oh, shoot, I don't know why she going to all of that in, in our church. We, we don't do that. Can I tell you, when I first come to Antioch, you better not say amen too loud. When I first step camped up on this campus, you better not say amen too loud. You better not say hallelujah too loud or they will shut you down. We had people running people out the back door while we was preaching them in the door. They didn't want drums here. No, didn't want no drum. Didn't want no drum. Didn't want none of that stuff but God. Come on here, somebody. And once we start praising God, and like, see, God, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all me. He said, listen, if you just praise me, if you just give me praise, I'll draw up to you. Yeah. Let me tell you, that's why on, when, we do our, when we do our offering, don't you let another deacon, don't you let another deacon come up here and, re, and, and, and receive your offering without you putting a praise on it first. Yeah. See, if, you're, if your money is funny, that's the time you ought to praise God about it. Come on here, somebody. Listen, when, when you're giving your offering, please do not. Do I have an envelope in here for a minute? Do I get an envelope? Maybe I got an envelope. Give me an envelope. When you put your, when you put your money in the next envelope, I ain't trying. Well, they got another preaching scheme to get us, give, our, give us our money. <laughs> Come on, don't you, don't you get that twisted. I'm trying to teach you something here. The reason why we don't have as much because nobody teach you how to do it. God said, I inhabit the praise of my people. And when you give God an offering and give God praise with it, God comes. He said, he's drawn to praise. And when you start praising God, said, listen, I gave them $10 and they praised me like that. I'm going to make sure they get $20 next week because they'll, if, if I give them $100, they're going to go. They're gonna, I mean, gonna, see, God says, listen, if I was hungry, I wouldn't give you nothing. He said, come on, I own a count of 1000 here. So what do you want from us, God? I just want your praise. That's all I want. I want you to tell me your thing. See, the Bible says, if you delight yourself in him, he'll give you this. I, Y'all but listen to what I'm saying. He said, if you delight yourself in me, I'll give you not only what you want, not only what you need. He said, I'll give you the desires. See, the desires of my heart, I don't even have to say something. Have you ever been blessed sometimes? You, let me tell you something one time. Let me tell you something. One time, let me, let me tell you something. Let me. I had, a, I had a taste for some, I had some taste for, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was okra and rice or whatever it was. But I, when I got home, when I got home, I smelled, <laughs> smelled the kitchen. And I got in the house, and my baby had the whole house stinking. And I said, I've been thinking about that all day long. You see, I said, baby, what made you, what made you cook that? She said, she said baby, I'm going to make sure my baby got anything. He was see. God told her, come on somebody. See, while I was at Antioch working in the office, God had met Joyce in the grocery store. Come on here. Some, you, better talk, you better hear. God had met Joyce in the grocery store and told Joyce to cook this for my boy because my boy was praising me. Come on somebody at church and serve me now. He wants some this to eat. Come on. I don't mean the neck bones. I don't know what it was, but I know one thing. I hugged him. <laughs> Listen, I'm trying to tell you something here. See, you got to rekindle your zeal for God. And I don't care what nobody else says. I want you to rekindle your joy. Jesus, when he said, listen, the Bible says, the zeal of the Lord house has eaten me up. He would know you see, in essence, he said, the zeal of God house is going to get me killed. And guess what, folks? They killed him. Because he came through and he kept asking him, what right you have to do this? Because the money changers and Caiaphas asked him, what authority you get to throw over the money changers? What authority? He was thinking, see, they didn't know that they were standing in the presence of God. They, they asked him, what authority? What authority do I have? See, if they only knew who they was talking to, they would have been more quiet. And sometimes we come to church and we look at people, we see people wrapped in skin, and you don't know God is speaking in your life. See, God will use the weak things of the world to confound those things that are mighty. And often, sometimes we think God is wrapped up in there. No, no. See, God is speak. See, didn't God talk to him? Remember one time Peter forgot a sermon Jesus had told him? He says, Peter, before you even, before, you, before, the, before the, the chicken croak three times, you're going to tell somebody, you don't even know me. So he says, so God put a word in a, in a, in a chicken's mouth. And, and when Peter got through denying him, the chicken Amen. And Peter knew he did not. Let me tell you something. God can put a word in somebody's spirit, may not be wrapped in the same package you want, but it be just the word that you need. 
I need you to now rekindle your zeal for the Lord. Now, Sundays, don't just pick out Sundays in which, can I give it one more stats? I'm going to let y'all go on another set and let y'all go home. I'll say one more, y'all. Should be looking for one more. 70% of those attending church one or more times a month never share their faith with a stranger. 70% of unchurched people have never been invited in church all of their life. 70% of Americans have never been invited to church. How many people that you work with every day? How many people that you walk past the supermarket? How many people that souls need to be saved that's pumping gas next to you and you never said a word? I would hate it, the great white throne judgment, and it's going to be one. This is judgment that all the living and dead going to stand before God. And I'm going to close with this. There's going to be a great white throne judgment. Everybody, rich and rich and, and, and poor, bond and free, short, whatever, go stand at great white throne judgment. There's coming a day at that great white throne judgment. At that throne, the only people going to be there at the great white throne judgment is people that's going to the lake of fire. Hallelujah. And I would hate to be at the, because when Jesus is judging everybody in the world, I would hate to be standing there with the Lord because he said we're going to rule and reign with him. I would hate at the great white throne judgment while I'm standing there with Jesus and people walk by and says, Pastor Jones, I've seen you. I work with you every day and you never said a word to me. I, I would hate to say that, that I grew up with you. We were homeboys together, and you never even invited me to go to church. Well, Pastor, I don't know how to witness. No, you ain't got to witness. Bring me to church. If you can't preach to them, I'll preach to them. Come on, somebody. I, I would hate them looking across the great white throne while they're being thrown in the lake of fire. That somebody looks and says, Pastor Jones, you know, I work with you. And not one time did you say to me that I needed Jesus in my life. I, 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 I wish that none of us would have because it's, it's real. I believe the Bible. I believe that one day it's going to happen. And I believe that right now we're closer than ever because look at our country right now. Listen, Khrushchev said he will not have to invade America. Khrushchev said way back in 19, I think 59 says, well, I'll never have to attack America because we're going to attack them from within. Russia, Khrushchev, one of Russia's leaders. And guess what's happening today? America is imploding on the inside. We're not, nobody's going to take us. We're going to implode on the inside right now. Look at Washington, D.C. right now. Everything is going haywire and we're still playing church. We're playing church right now. It's no time to be playing church. And right now we got leaders in the White House. I don't know. Well, anyway. Oh, oh. We, got, we got a whole bunch of stuff that's going on that need the church to rise up and be the church. Listen, Antioch, I'm making this appeal to you. I'm making this appeal to you in Antioch. I want us to rekindle our worship. I don't want, I don't want money to be a hindrance to our praise and worship team. Our musicians, our choirs are nothing whatsoever. I want us because, see, it's about people, not about things. Come on, somebody. Sometimes we get wrapped up in dollars. We get wrapped up in buildings and not knowing that the people is what calls us to need buildings. It's, it's, it's when you get a place where worship is worship is experienced and people are coming. I can tell you the money will come with the people come. But if the people are leaving, the money leaves. Come on, somebody. In order, to, in order for us to get more financing, it's because we got to reach more people. And more people, you're not getting for the money. If they come, they'll give them money because pray, they are coming to a place where they're worshiping God. Let me tell you, the reason why I give, give money because I know the God who gave it to me. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't give tithe because some handsome deacon tell me to give tithe and some preacher tell me, God going to put holes in your pocket. You ain't going to get this. No, I don't do it for that. I do it because God has blessed me. God has blessed me in such a way. And ask me how I know. Let me tell you something. When me and my wife got married, I told y'all I was rich. I had $100 to my name. And the $100 I got when I married that girl, she married me on credit. Y'all, let me tell you right now. My stepfather gave me $100 as a marriage gift. I had $100, and my wife knew I had that $100. I told her she married me for my money. God is good. God is good, Wayne. 
And that's when I come in. If y'all don't say amen to pastor, I'll, y'all know I'll say amen to myself. I'll say light, say amen lights because I know how good God is. God has kept me, y'all. God, God has kept me. God has kept me no matter what has gone on. God has kept me. And I want you to know, if you delight yourself, and from this day forward, I want you to come to church and not worry about who's preaching, who's teaching, what choir is singing. You're coming here that you can worship God. You don't, you don't, you're not worried about what the worship styles is because you can worship God with just amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You don't have to have all everybody jumping all over the place. You don't need all that stuff. You just need a heart that is longing after God. And that's all God is looking for. And folks, listen, while, while the, my, I said, would, y'all, would, y'all, would y'all come? Because I, I, I'm looking. Listen, y'all see what Anna, and I don't know if Anna's still here. Y- y'all, see, y'all see the things that Anna and her team did. I am a pastor. I am very reluctant to put anything out. I want stuff done with excellence. Don't come, don't come telling me to do something, you know, and you ain't got your game plan in place. Come on, somebody. I don't, I don't, don't come telling me, pastor, they're doing this over here and they're doing, no, 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 no. If you're going to do something, I want you to do it. Don't, don't come writing something on the paper and say, let's do this. No, I need you to tell me what you're doing. I need you to tell me why we're going to do this. I need you to tell me where we're going to do this. I need you to tell me when we're going to do it. I need you to tell me how much it's going to cost to do it. And I also need you to tell me who's going to be doing it. Come on, somebody. Then once you can tell me that, this is what Anna did when she started coming to me about this inside out thing. Come on, somebody. The girl laid out everything they was going to do, who was going to be doing it, what was going to be doing it, and she disarmed me because I'm, a, I'm the kind of pastor, you come to me, I'm very reluctant about doing a whole lot of new stuff. Don't, don't come to her and give me new stuff and you ain't got no plan. If God, if God lays something on your heart to do an anti-out, then maybe God is calling you to do it. Don't, call, stop, don't start laying nothing on our plate and saying, Pastor, yeah, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to this church because they're doing it. Well, if God has laid this on your heart, then why don't, why don't, you, be a, why don't you be the next Nehemiah? Why don't you be the next Gideon? And you do. You remember Gideon you said, wait be all the miracles? Then God, God said, Gideon, Gideon? He says, he said, yeah, God, he said, where be all the miracles that I heard from? Where, where be all the things I heard I forefather? And God says to Gideon, go in this thy strength. What strength? He says, God, he says, go in what strength? He was said, Gideon concerned was his strength. When you start being concerned about God's people and the things of God, that is your strength. God said, I don't need you to be educated. I don't need you to have a pen and money. I just need you to be concerned. And what God will do, he'll anoint you to do what you thought you couldn't do. Didn't he do it with Gideon? Didn't he do it with Gideon? And guess what, folks? He can do it also with you. So I don't know who I'm talking to in this house right now, but you know what? Life have no meaning if you have not Jesus in your life. Listen, he's the one that gives you me. You looking at, you looking at, amen. They call him bastard child. Come on, somebody. You look at somebody that, I thought I was going to be a great football player and all this kind of stuff. I even wasn't big enough to do that. Back in the 70s, I had given me an afro. I had got me a car and put half gangster white walls on. I thought I was going to be a super fly. I had all kind of stupid dreams. While I wanted to be a pimp, God wanted me to be a preacher. Come on, somebody. And God saved me. God saved me and gave me a reason for living. Now, every day I get up now, I tell tell Pastor Thomas, I I can't leave my day without spending an hour or two with the Lord every morning. And not because it's it's some religious practice. It's because I've fallen so much in love with Jesus that I can't help myself. I get up and sometimes I can't shut it down. I wake up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm talking to him and his word is coming back to me. So when I'm talking to God and spirit scriptures is coming back to me, I know that I'm talking to God. But when scriptures come, he's talking to me. And I spend time with God. I want you to know I love this man with all of my heart. He has been so good to me. I'm trying to same Jesus that loved me. He also loved you. And guess what, folks? He know your name. Everybody's standing. Everybody's standing. Everybody's saying, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're going through. But right now, I just need you to rekindle, amen, your zeal for the Lord. I, if you had never trusted Christ, I want you to come today. I want you to come and give your life to him. I'm not telling you to stop smoking. I'm not telling you to stop drinking. I'm not telling you to stop being a, a whatever that you are. I'm not asking you to come be a Baptist. I'm asking you to receive Christ. That's all I'm asking. If you're here today, would you come? Those, those, nobody, nobody moving yet. Nobody, I'm just, just, just not Simon, but Charles say, hold still right now. 
If you're coming for prayer, if you're coming for prayer, I want you to come. Those that may want to join this church, you can come. Maybe there's somebody praying for somebody else's help, not yours, but praying for somebody else. I want you to come. Anything that you need right now, by faith, I want you to come right now. So start coming right now. Start coming right now. What are the needs are? You come. Somebody in this room right now, you're hurting. And while I was preaching, she was like, you know, I don't know if you know my name because I've been praying about this thing. I've been dealing with this thing and nothing seems to be happening. Do we even care? This man is driving me crazy. I am faithful. My kids don't seem to understand me. This job, I don't like this job. I hate this job. But I can't leave because it's my livelihood. Maybe somebody's sick. Maybe somebody doing something in your body. He may heal, he may not. But one thing, he will give you grace to handle it. Come on. Who's here that never trusted the Lord? And you like to do it today like to do it today. You like to put your faith. I ain't telling you to stop being, a, I'm not telling you, I'm just asking you, if you don't know Christ, you can do it today. Are you here? Are you here? Are you here? I'm saved and know I'm safe. Pastor, I like to join today. Are you here? Are you here? I'd like to join this church. Are you here? Praise God that everybody's safe and everybody has a church home. Can I pray for you? One second. What is it that you're praying for? Some of you are crying right now. So what are you leaning and asking God for right now? You see it? Can you see it? What is it? Can you see? You can't receive it till you can see it. Can you see it? I want you to close your eyes on that and lock into it. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, for this in which my sister's praying for. God, we touch and agree in the name of Jesus. Lord, we love you so much, and God, in the things that, God, we've been dealing with, God, we found that, Lord, we can't deal with it on our own. Lord, we love you so much. And, God, I ask in Jesus' name, please, if there's something that we've done that has caused these things to come upon us, and we ask you, God, to forgive us. God, the Bible says if we confess our sin, that word means that, Lord, if I agree that I've done wrong, then, Lord, you are just and faithful to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray for my sister. I pray for my brother. I pray for those ones that are in dead-end jobs. And, God, I know that, God, you own a cattle a thousand hills and all the gold and the silver belong to you, Lord. It's nothing they need that, George, you don't have. God, I ask in Jesus' name. And for those, God, that are dealing with things, I ask that, God, you provide the grace that they may deal with it. Give us the grace that you gave to Paul. Paul prayed three times that, God, you may take this, this thorn in his flesh from him. But, God, you said to him, my grace is sufficient, and my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, most certainly that I will glory in my weakness, that the power of God may rest on me. And, Father, in Jesus' name, give us that mind. And we give you praise. We give you glory. And, God, now in Jesus' name, this is what we're praying for, God. We're going to reach up as if, God, we received it for you by faith. God, we're reaching for it right now in the name of Jesus. And God, in the name of Jesus, we're reaching for it. And God, and we're going to put a praise on it right now to thank you for it. You said, by everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, to make our request be made unto God. And the peace of God that passed all understanding to God, our hearts, and our minds. And God, right now, we thank you and we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen. amen.